Hello everyone, I'm Pastor Phil from the Door of Hope Church here in Maryborough, Queensland, Australia. We pray and hope that these videos and messages are of encouragement to you in your walk with the Lord. Uh, hello to all our people from different regions in the country and the world. Blessings to you from here in Queensland. If you're benefiting from these videos, we'd encourage you to subscribe and also if you'd like notification when we upload new videos, we encourage you to ring the bell. If you'd like to make a donation to the ministry, there's a link in the comment section below. We pray and hope from the whole team here at the Door of Hope that you be blessed by these videos. So we're continuing on from last week in the theme, So Great Salvation, which is a three-word statement by the writer of Hebrews who seem, very much seems to be Paul, that so great salvation encapsulates the fullness of all God desired to bring forth many sons. That's the thing that surely, just it, to just immediately connect to our communion word, surely that great desire with which he desired to have that Passover the last and then the first, the last supper of the old and the first of the new creation life where many sons can now can be born of God's life. Surely that great desire with which he was yearning to have that Passover feast was the, the so great salvation. Surely that was what it says in the 12th chapter of Hebrews when it says, for the joy set before him he endured the cross. Salvation is the first aspect and the second aspect. The so, great as the so great salvation is being born again, receiving the life, and then being matured as we walk in intimacy with Christ, now having our spirit full of Christ Jesus and our soul life, everything to do with our natural life, our whole intellect, our personality, our mind, our will, our emotions, everything to do with the human soul being brought forth in the likeness from glory to glory to the same image. And that word image is not just an image like we think of just a sort of a reflection on a screen. That word in the Greek there is the substance. He created man in his image. He created us in the, the substance of something to do with who he is so that through the divine nature, through the new birth, we receive the very divine life of Christ. God himself, the fullness of God, we receive. And then that is then be that from glory to glory. Glory is the presence, the Shekinah glory. That's the presence. That, where, where you see glory in the Bible, and I haven't counted how many references there are to glory, but it's an enormous study in itself. The glory is the divine presence. And when someone is born again, the God takes up residence in that person's spirit, born, saved. And no one shall ever take that from them. Jesus was so clear. The Bible is so clear about that, that it's an eternal salvation. But then there's the so great, there's the ongoing infusing of his life from glory to glory in all that we are as human souls. And then there's the individual and the corporate because God's great desire was that he would have a corporate people called, firstly called, the church. Then the bride. Then the heavenly Mount Zion. Throughout all eternity, members of the building that God is building. So you're thinking of that song we often sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. There it is individually. We all sing it individually. This wretch, through the divine life, whosoever believes in him will have the everlasting divine life within them. And we all sing it individually and then I love the way the, the song, that song, goes on to sing, to, to bring the corporate 
How great the pain of searing loss. The father turned his face away. We sang that today. He was condemned. He came under the condemnation. Why? Because he took the place of the sinner. He became the curse of sin. He, he took our place there. And so the father turns his face away. As wounds which marred the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Our great salvation. Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 3. And yes, Pauline and Judy, I haven't forgotten to pray. We'll pray soon. <laughs> Pauline and Judy picked me up on that once, once upon a time. But just that little statement, which is the heading of what we're talking about. Uh, so great salvation. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, inbreeding many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Let's pray. Lord, I just call upon your name. Lord, we tremble at your word and I just pray that every word just be utterly aligned with you, Lord Jesus. That everything I say today could be the miracle of a ministry of the Spirit, more than just even ministering by your Spirit, but a very ministry of the Spirit of Christ himself. Lord, we call on your name as we speak your word and as we listen and hear your word. Do a work in us, we pray, through your word. In Jesus' name. So we looked last week at the two aspects and I referenced out of the many, numerous references of the salvation past tense, I picked Ephesians 2.8, the Apostle Paul, he says, for ye are saved, past tense. These are the ones that Jesus was talking about in Nicodemus, about to Nicodemus in John 3. And we, we looked at how it's so clear, and again, numerous, but we were just picking one passage where Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, but many, many references in the New Testament that show that to believe into the Lord Jesus is to receive the divine life. And that equals being born again. And that equals being saved. That's, we, we, we went through that last week, didn't we? Jesus was very, very plain on that. That to believe into him is to receive the life. And that is the same as what he was trying to explain to Nicodemus about what the new birth actually is, where you're born of the divine life. And then he summed it all up after John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Seven chapters later, Jesus says, for I have given them eternal life. These are my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They now know me in spirit. Their spirit's been enlivened. We can now communicate. You can now worship. We now have an intimate walk because you're born of my spirit. You're born of God. And then he said, for God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. To be saved in that first aspect is the same as being born again. And born again, being born again is the same as having the divine life. Then we looked at the second aspect of going on in that salvation, which is where the person, the individual, is through this mysterious thing that's difficult for us to get our human minds around in the scripture because we're, we're looking at the ways of God but this mysterious interplay and relationship between doing works that are the will of the Father and being transformed in my soul, in my natural life, being transformed as I am conformed more and more to his death. So he says, take up the cross. He said, whoever wants to follow me, he's talking to ones who are born again. They're saved. These are ones who are already believers. But now we're talking about the second aspect of salvation. And he says, if, if you love your soul, 
you'll, you'll lose it. But if you hate it, you'll find it. And that's what the Apostle Peter's talking about when he talks about the ongoing salvation of the soul. Peter talks about you have been regenerated. That's another word for being born again, he says in his letter. You've been regenerated, born again, and you've been called now through these great promises, through the word of God, for the salvation of your soul, for the ongoing second aspect of growing and maturing as sons of God. So we just used the verse last week of 1 Corinthians 15 for the second aspect of going on in Christ and growing and maturing, where Paul says, and that's a classic chapter, isn't it? Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, because he's talking about the whole salvation, the so great salvation, all the way through. Chapter 15 is about the resurrection, isn't it? And he's assuring the Corinthian church and every other believer through the word of God that the salvation that he has is absolutely spirit, soul and body. So much so that the so great salvation ends with a resurrection body when you're given a body like as under his glorious body. He said, I, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-2, but I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I announced to you, which also you received, in which you stand. These ones are born again. Now, by which also you are saved, also, see, that word also is very important. He's getting on to the second aspect. See, I brought the gospel to you and you're born again, you're saved. And no one can snatch you out of the Father's hand, out of Christ's hand or the Father's hand. By which also, see, but wait, there's more. You are saved if you hold fast. Now we're getting iffy. There's an ongoing process. If you hold fast the word which I announced to you as the gospel, unless indeed you have believed in vain. So this is God's favourite subject. This is God, this is the whole, this is the whole everlasting covenant purpose. Isn't it amazing when you read Genesis right from the beginning of the Bible and before there's anything made or created we've got God 1 and 3 speaking us and we God singular God Adonai Adonai is the Hebrew there. God, sing, and that word is a singular word. One God. Jehovah Yahweh is then a... Well, it's, it's one. Actually, I, I did that back to front. I did that in a dyslexic way, so I'm just going to flip it around again. Adonai is actually a plural, a plural word. It, it, it extends itself to plural. Jehovah Yahweh is singular Lord, one Lord. And you've got the Lord God there and it says, let us make man in our image. How amazing that before anything was created, before even the heavens were created, the heavens weren't eternal. God's eternal from an eternity past. He was there. But you've got them in this divine council. So the Bible talks so much about the the council of God. Here they are sitting down and I speak reverently at a business meeting, a council meeting. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit wanted to fulfil their great, their eternal purpose, which was to invest their own life, to actually allow their own divine life to come into a creature called man. And by the way, when the Bible says man or sons, so I was going to say, in case there's anyone who's not read the Bible a lot and you've been to university and done sociology 101 and you're doing humanism and feminism, don't be offended when we just talk sons of God all the time. Because in the Bible, sons is absolutely, speaking of every male and female human being that are born of God. 
It says of man in the same way. He created man. Don't be offended, feminists. I'm not. I'm sure there's none here that are in, in that worldly philosophy. In, he created man in his image, male and female. He created them. So it's like man or sons is just like it's like it's like zebra. You know, if we talk man, we're talking. Sometimes it's specific. You've got to read the context, man, man and woman, of course, because we have the gender in this life, in that way. But, you know, a zebra, if we talk zebra, the female zebras, I'm sure, wouldn't get offended because we're just saying zebra. It's a zebra, male and female. That's the way the Bible talks about man. Man is male and female. Sons of God. He's bringing many sons to glory. And it's speaking of all our brothers and sisters. So I just wanted to clear that for anybody that gets is not into the Bible understanding the truth and language there. Uh, let's now look at Hebrews. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is the, so rich. So rich. The first chapter is similar. In, in, in some ways it's similar to the first chapter of the book of John. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of God. He is, he is deity. He is God. That's how John starts his gospel, isn't it? And Hebrews starts here. And then Hebrews is comparing the old ministry of angels, the old covenant, which had to do with angels got a, a role in that, in administering that old covenant, to the new. But... Just before we go to Hebrews, I'm just going to read actually Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and just connect it to where I was about this. Let's, let's consider the amazing thing that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were together in a council, in the, what the scripture calls the council of God, and they covenanted to make man in their image and after their likeness to two things, receive his divine life into them and then to be the expressors of that divine life. And now that's why, that's, that's why we've got this, pecu- it's, it's, it's mysterious and peculiar only to the natural mind, but why when we look at Christian maturity, it's absolutely to do with something that he's doing in your very person and in your soul, life. It's to do with your nature, but actually it's absolutely tied to your works, your obedience and your works. Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. We'll get there. That's astounding. If he did, how much more we must be? Are we? Are we learning obedience? by the things which we're suffering, born again ones. Paul says in Ephesians 3, uh, no, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3 verse 11, he says, according to the eternal purpose. That, That is talking about eternity before as well as eternity after. It's actually speaking in context, he's speaking more about eternity before. This is God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit sitting down together and saying, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. This is the eternal purpose. This is the whole story. This is not just God's favourite subject. This is his only subject. Which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Back in chapter 1 of Ephesians, having made known, verse 9 and 10, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself for the administration of the fullness of times. Administration suitable for the fullness of times. Most translations leave out the word suitable. For the administration of the fullness of times to head up all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth in him. 
So that's Paul. Let's jump back to Hebrews. God, who at various times, chapter 1, verse 1, and in various ways spoke in the times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, this is the days of the fullness of times, that Paul was talking about in Ephesians, he's talking about time now, but he's talking about God back in eternity, then in time he creates time and creates matter and creates man and woman, man, male and female, so that his great passion and desire and yearning and purpose can be fulfilled, that is to have his own life born into or somehow to be infused into human beings that we can grow up in that divine nature, has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things. When we see heir, we're talking about inheritance. Whenever I see that, I remember Jesus at 12 and he's, he went missing and he was in the temple. He was, in the, he was focused on God's building, God's house. God's everlasting covenant, speaking to the leaders there. He said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Jesus inherited all things and then in him, the Bible says, we are to be co-heirs with him. That, only, that inheritance for the sons of God happens to the extent that we are about our father's business. Not all sons of God will inherit the same as others because this, has, this inheritance has to do with the second aspect of salvation, of learning obedience by the things which we suffer. we're suffering. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Jesus Christ the Son, the fullness of God, the, the, the fullness of the glory of God, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made himself, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he was incarnated. What the apostle is saying there, he was incarnated so that he could accomplish the redemption of many other human beings through his crucifixion having been become so much more than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they for to which of the angels did he ever say you are my son today I have begotten you there was a day when Christ was begotten of God and that day was the day, I'm going to strongly suggest, of his resurrection. When he went into death as that grain of wheat and he came up as a sheaf bringing many sons to glory. His resurrection life, his resurrection equates to his being begotten of God in the new creation, now fully God, fully man, with the new creation life bursting forth in flesh so that many sons, ones who he's not ashamed to call his brethren, could have the same life growing in them unto the fullness of salvation. How can we, how can we say that, that today I have begotten you is the day of his resurrection? Acts chapter 13, verse 33. We'll go, just have a quick look there. Feel free if you don't want to turn, I'll just... And there's a preaching going on in Antioch, I believe, um, by in, um, Jerusalem. This is right at the beginning, isn't it? Acts. Oh, no, this is 13, Antioch, yeah. Um, I'll just pick it right up and just so we can keep moving on. And we declare to you the gospel, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, 
in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, the resurrection of Christ Jesus was the day that he was begotten as the son of God, where the fulfilment of what he did through the cross was for forgiveness of sins and cleansing and washing and, and uh, justification in that first aspect of salvation. But it was everything of the provision for the life now. And, and the Apostle Paul calls Jesus the life-giving spirit. Since the resurrection now, begotten of God, when the Holy Spirit comes into the, the one who believes into him, they are born again. But where, G, where the Spirit is, they're all there. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, verse 6 of Hebrews 1, he says that all of God's angels worship him. I believe that that verse 6 is is about the fact that he is going to come again. The English doesn't read all that easily for us. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all of God's angels worship. He's now talking about the fullness of salvation where the Lord Jesus Christ went through death for justification to save us and then all the way through to the resurrection life where he's begotten so that many sons can be born of God to have the life in them and then we can grow up into him. And now he's talking about when he comes again when to set up his throne in his kingdom When he comes again into the world, the scripture says, let all of God's angels worship him. We're going to worship the Lord of glory when he comes. Amen? But he's coming to set up a kingdom, a temple. The scripture talks about a temple, which is going to house the divine nature of God throughout all eternity. He talks about a sheepfold. He talks about a body, the body of Christ. And it talks about a field, a building, a field. All of these are talking about the one thing, God's building, which is the ongoing maturity of the sons of God to fulfil God's everlasting covenant purpose, to have a corporate new man, expressing his life, the divine life throughout all eternity. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of your righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. That was why Jesus so longed for that supper. And verse 10, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. So now it's just declaring that he is going right back around again. This same Lord Jesus Christ was the one who created the heavens and the earth in the first place. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain and they will grow old, etc. Let's jump down to verse chapter 2, verse 11. We've read this a few times already, but just feel to keep reading it. For it was fitting for him, verse 10 of chapter 2, it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one. Absolutely, intrinsically one. This blows our mind every time, doesn't it? Especially in John 17. Because it goes all directions. He's saying, Father, I'm one with you. You're one with me. They're one with me. They're one with you. This is the amazing everlasting covenant that God 
would come into man and that man would come into him. And that there is one temple, one heavenly Zion, which is made with the material of the sons of God, which is the substance of the glory of the divine nature that we, 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 we meet in Christ Jesus. He who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Uh, you know, that's another thing. It was only when he had rose from the dead, like we were saying before, the resurrection was the point where he became the begotten son, the firstborn among many brothers with the divine nature. Once he rose from the dead, he's, as the life-giving spirit, now people can be born of the spirit and born of God. He can now literally live inside them. And he can now literally change their soul life from glory to glory by the same spirit, which is the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And see, this calling them brothers, we, we, can, we can confirm it because it was only once he'd rose from the dead that he said to Mary, go and tell my brothers. He'd never talked about them as brothers until then. Now they were essentially and truly and literally brothers because they could now be born of the same divine life. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. When we gather as the called out ones, the church, born of God, Jesus is not just singing beside us. He's not singing. He, Jesus, is worshipping the Father. These are the words of the Lord Jesus to his Father. When we in spirit now, in intimacy with him, in union with him, worship, the Lord Jesus, the firstborn son, is worshipping the Father in and through us. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church, the assembly, the called out ones. I will sing praise to you, Father through these sons, these brothers that you've given me, brothers and sisters. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. These are the words, the worship of the one who sanctifies many sons. Okay, let's go to Paul again. 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. I did say at the beginning of last week that I'm just going to go all over the place. And I've almost pleaded with the Lord if I could just be systematic, but it doesn't seem I'm allowed to be. So I'm just... 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, 2nd chapter. 2 Corinthians 2. Therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. It's quite obvious that Paul in this letter is talking about a brother in Christ that he talked about in the first letter in chapter 5. And that brother had committed a really terrible sin, like a, like a particularly, Paul said, not a, you don't even see this sort of stuff amongst the Gentiles. Is, is an immorality, an incest type or, a, or a something within the family. But Paul in his great love for this brother who was born again and saved, clearly, you can clearly see by the language that this guy was saved, born again, but he'd done a terrible thing. And Paul said, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. Paul also says that your whole, in Thessalonians, he says that your whole spirit, soul and body may be preserved blameless at the coming 
the appearing of the Lord Jesus. This guy, his spirit was saved, but Paul was saying he, he needs to have it preserved in that reality of the divine life. And he, he, he asked the Corinthians to actually stop, put him, put him out of fellowship as a discipline. And the beautiful thing is that when we get to the second letter, we find that this guy is gloriously, the discipline worked. The book of Hebrews goes right into the way that God the Father disciplines all of his sons. He disciplines those that he loves. And it comes in lots of different grades too in the New Testament. There's a sort of a light discipline. Then there's a chastening. Then there's a really heavy chastening. And there's actually even in the New Testament a punishment for those that are born again on their way to heaven but are living like they're not. Because God the Father is a perfect Father and he has a way to bring me back on track so that I can be a partaker of the glory of the so great salvation, of all the fullness of the inheritance that he wants me to participate in in Christ. And here we've got this beautiful example in Scripture. He's saying to, this God, he's saying to the Corinthians, look, you know, last time I wrote to you, I was asking you to put this guy out. But now um, he's saying, um, I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end I also wrote, the first letter when I wrote, that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. So the Lord's working at work in all the sons of glory here. It's not just the guy who's been disciplined Paul the Apostles, seeing if these others are going to walk in obedience to the truth. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So why am I jumping to this? Because all of Paul's letters are speaking about this entire so great salvation. He, Paul is all, and Peter, all, every book of the Bible is talking about God's favourite subject. It's talking about those getting born again, which is a free gift, and then pressing in to the Lord to walk intimately in a way that is pleasing to the Lord so that we can obtain an inheritance which is not a free gift, it's a reward. When we get born again, that's not a reward for anything. It's just, a, it's just a gift. For you're saved by grace, through faith, faith, Ephesians 2 8, and this not of yourself, it is God's gift. So every letter is like this. This is why it's been hard to prepare this word because I keep sort of jumping around. But. Um, so he's, he's talking about this guy who's being disciplined. And then we get to chapter 3 in the letter, verse 6. Who also made us sufficient, and I'm just, all I can do is pick it up in mid-sentences because Paul never, he either never was taught by his English teacher to not do big, long sentences or he didn't listen to what his teacher said or he didn't actually speak English, which I think might be it, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. See, ministers, uh, as I was praying and calling on the name of the Lord as we started today, it's not just ministering by the spirit, it's ministering the spirit himself, the spirit of God, fullness of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all manifested in the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the life-giving spirit. There's a difference between ministering or, or, being, or going to work, asking the Lord to help me, to help me do things by his spirit. And actually, there's a difference between that, doing things with his strength. But Lord, I need to do it by your strength. Well, that's a great revelation. Not by my strength, your strength. That's a good revelation, but there's a deeper thing. That when we're walking in intimacy with the Lord, we don't just minister by the Spirit, we minister the Christ himself. We literally live the Lord Jesus Christ because we are members of him, born of the same life, for the great eternal purpose to express the life, to live the life. 
So Paul is saying to the Corinthians here, look, he's talking about himself and other co-working apostles. He's saying, look, we, this is the way we minister. We have, we, we have had a revelation of the glorious covenant of God. And we, when we minister, we don't just ask him for his strength and then try to prepare a good sermon. We are literally ministering the life into which, by which you've been born of God, the, the ministry of the Spirit. So he's comparing this then. And then he says, then he compares it with the old covenant, which was a ministry of angels. The angels have uh, some sort of a role in, in the old covenant, evidently. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? I'm going to have to finish real soon. I know that. Pauline, I know that. Because <laughs> I actually didn't look at what time we started. So what? Oh, we've got it. Oh, look at that. It's 40 minutes. We've got at least, at least five minutes. Um. So then he says, okay, so he's describing the ministry, the New Testament, New Covenant ministry. Since Christ rose from the dead, now you can not only be born again, but the very life of Jesus, which is the fullness of the divine nature, can actually be worked in you. And as we looked at last week in 1 Corinthians 15, every star, which is the symbol the Holy Spirit chose to use to symbolise sons of God who are born again, starting in first, uh, Genesis 15 with Abraham and then 1 Corinthians 15, every star differs from star in glory. The way that the glory of Jesus in you is going to worship the Father throughout all eternity and be obedient to whatever the works are. He's, there's, it's going to be a busy time. We're entering into rest when we're, in, when we're no longer here. But that rest is going to be a very active rest. The Bible is so clear. The Lord has so much for his sons of God to then go and express. We, it's just beyond us. The scripture doesn't give us much information. But one thing we do know is that the way the glory of you, see, glor being glorified is the presence of Christ, firstly in your spirit, then throughout all of your soul life, as you hate your life, deny the self, and say, Lord, I don't want this to be me. You live. It's no longer I that lives. Let it be Christ, your Lord, you live me. You live me, Jesus. I surrender to you. You live me. Lord, I, that attitude there, that's nothing but pride. Lord, I, can, I want that to be committed again to your death. Purge me, change me, glorify. See, this is the glorification of the sons of God, bringing many sons to glory. And then... The, the, the final glorification is a body glorified. Jesus was glorified in a new body. The Bible is very clear. The spirit gets regenerated. That's a, that's a miracle working of the power of God when we're born again. The spirit is regenerated. The soul is transformed. And then the body is transfigured. Just like when Jesus said, come on, I'll come and I'll show you, up on the mountain. And then he just, the glory, the radiance of light, just, he just, he's just turned into this. The, the scripture seems to just be struggling, certainly in the English language, to the, the glory of the, that's that Hebrews 1, the effulgence of his glory. That we're, it's the glorious presence. And they watched him. He got them to witness his body being transfigured into the new glorious body. And then the angels came and say, what? and then he, off he goes, he ascends now. Once being glorified, now he's ascended. And the angels come and say, what? why are you looking up like that, looking like dismay? The same thing's going to happen to you. You are going to go in the same way he went if you continue in the glorifying process. And in fact, every born again person has a certain destiny. But what we don't have is certain. We, we, those will, those, anyone who's born again will most assuredly have has a, an absolute assurance that they 
have eternal life and will be with the Lord. But what's uncertain is all the, the rest of the second aspect. It's to what extent our soul life is glorified. Uh, so let's, we better jump back to Second Corinthians, and I am nearly finished. So he's talking about his ministry. So, so this is clearly not ministry to get these people born again. This is clearly the ministry of the new covenant, which is for all of the church, by the ministry of the apostles, to achieve something, to achieve that second element of our maturing life. And he says, let's go to Second Corinthians verse 6 now, uh, chapter 3, verse 6. He made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant... Um, no, we better jump jump down to so he's he's he's, just, he's comparing and contrasting the glory of the old and the much greater glory of the new in Christ. Verse fourteen. But their minds were blinded, for until that this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. So that's the Old Testament again. He's comparing. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. Father, Son and Holy Spirit are distinctly are distinct in the Scripture. They are distinctly three, but you cannot separate them. One God. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And in actual fact, I think in the English, you, you, in, in the Greek, you can take out of the just as by the Spirit Lord. Because it's, it's talking about two verses before, the Lord is the Spirit. But this transformation, brothers and sisters, this, this is, this is, um, this is mind-blowing, isn't it? Oh Lord, help us, illuminate us, Lord, to the glory of your gospel, your so great salvation. That same image, that's let us make man in our image and after our likeness. This is now being transformed in the substance of the reality of the firstborn son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul is firstly talking about him and his co-workers. He's saying this is our ministry, this is what's happening with us. Every day and actually most probably every hour, daily or and or hourly, we are being transformed into the same image of the firstborn, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you being transformed? Am I being transformed? Am, are we, how are we living our newborn life as sons of God? Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And of course... He didn't, he didn't need to have his nature changed. He had no sin nature. Jesus didn't need to uh, get a, a better character. I know I sure have. The Lord's had a lot to do with this character. So what's the, what's the Bible talking about then? See, it's talking about something way beyond just dealing with sin. It's talking because Jesus had no sin. But he was learning obedience by the things which he suffered. And we get back again to this thing that's difficult for the natural mind to understand, that in actual fact, maturity is as much about being obedient to the works of the Father and doing works. We're not saved by works. It's a free gift. But we are saved, in the second aspect, as we fulfil the works of the Father. Many will come to me in that day, he said, and he said it to the Christian, he said it to his believers in the Sermon on the Mount when he took them in Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7, a big long teaching, his first teaching to his own people, the believers. He leaves the crowd and takes his disciples aside and says, look, I've got to teach you 
about your life in me. And then he gave him that horrifying warning and he was kind of saying it prophetically. He was talking about a time that's yet to come. Many will come to me in that day and the day is very clear when I think it's very clear what that day is. It's the day of his judgment. It's the same day as Brother Philip has been ministering the last couple of sermons of last year. He's been talking about building on our salvation in 1 Corinthians 3. And it's, it's, to, it's the judgment seat. It's not the great white throne. It's not the place where a thousand years later, after the millennium, that the unbelievers will be judged and then cast into that terrible place where Satan and his angels are going. This is the judgment seat of Christ for his own people. And it's a day of fire. And it's a day of great loss. It's a horrendous day. It's a day of chastening. It's a day of reward. And the reward has to do with how much I've fulfilled the works of the Father. And then that mysterious connection there somehow, you, you can't separate them. It's, it's how much I've fulfilled the works of the Father and how much I've allowed him to change me. See, what it is, it's, it's divine nature and righteousness, righteous works. It, the, two, the two are inseparable. It, from glory to glory, he changes us in our the very nature of who we are, our very soul life, to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it's got to do with my obedient works, and so there's a reward for the end. They're not saved by works, no reward there, but for this there's a reward. I better close in prayer. Lord, we just cast ourselves before you, and we, Lord, we just always, whenever we come to your word, we are just, um, thank you, we're not overwhelmed. And the only reason for this is because we have this such great hope. That hope is you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you indwell us, Lord God. Thank you that we are sons of God, as we sang today. That we are a ch- I am a child of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just pray you continue to work in us for your glory, according to your word, in Jesus' name. Amen.